after about 10-15 years of teaching I got frustrated with the explanations that I was giving students. It's very easy as a teacher to convince your students and even easier your clients when they ask you what are you doing. If you have good, good images, if you uh, believe what you teach, that is also important, then it will fly, it will always be successful. But when uh, over the years you as teachers sit together and you debate why do we do the why do we work longitudinal to the muscle or cross why do we do it for 90 seconds because next door there is another club they call themselves blah blah practitioners and they also have hundreds of inspired uh, clients similar like we have so the anecdotal support is there for rolfing, but it's also there for Feldenkrais. It's also there for many osteopathic techniques, but each of them claim we are doing the most efficient manipulation of the tissue and the most efficient involvement of the client. And then you go up and drag selectively some scientific literature or semi-scientific literature that selectively strengthens that your 90 second point holding protocol is, is very powerful. But if then as a young assistant first and later as a teacher, you want to get your resources straight because you have these nagging students and they keep increasing. So most of you who have been in, involved in teaching, students are getting more and more demanding. They want to know your resources <laughs> and look them up yourself. And if you then as teachers get together and look at your resources, it, it becomes very thin and, and, and very frustrating. So several of us uh, went more into research, not to become active, but basically to orient and to go to scientific conferences that were at a, at a substantial level and to then report to our members what we learned from them. And Saul and I, we were early involved in the low back pain congresses. They had a really uh, high academic standards. So you knew that if somebody presents a, a research finding, that they had worked for years on it and done their statistics and done their control groups, etc. So that is basically what got me into science. And what I'm reporting to you now is basically what together with many others we have been finding out about the connective tissues of the fascial wrap in the human body. The question is why is fascia suddenly such a hype? It, it has become a hype. If you're a book publisher and you want to republish a book and it, it used to be called deep tissue massage or something like that, uh, the editor makes an emphasis to get the work fascia into the subtitle because then it will sell significantly more. So at this time, if you call something myofascial, people will, will look at it and read it. If it's called deep tissue, it's no longer considered to be so, so attractive. And that is based, and that is very uh, uh, important for us to understand, on a shift in the whole field of musculoskeletal medicine. In the past, anybody who was working with the human body as a sports medicine doctor, but also we as body workers, sooner or later you want to know what's under the skin in terms of Western anatomy. So you buy these books and this is basically the picture that we have been learning from that you have uh, about 400 different muscles each with a name, each muscle with an origin and with an insertion at the skeleton and the muscle is moving the skeleton and if you know where the attachments are then you don't need to learn by heart, then you can use logical reasoning what kind of rotation it does at what kind of position. So if you know that the piriformis, for example, attaches at the greater trochanter, then you know what kind of rotation it has to do in sitting or it has to do in standing. Just by logical reasoning, I love it. It's beautiful. And the more modern the pictures are, the more beautiful the muscles are. The problem, and this is great for learning for an exam. So these modern uh, pictures are great. The problem starts when you deal with real bodies. Uh, either when you do your first uh, dissection course, which in many countries is only reserved for the doctors. They were in, in Germany, it's still not possible in the basic training of a physiotherapist or massage practitioner to do dissections. It's only the doctors who do that. So this is basically the body that you see under the skin. If you want to know what's under the skin, 
sooner or later you will find this dense body suit. It's a cat suit all over the body, only attached at very few places, for example at the linea nuke, or where you have the dimples, or at the heel pad, and this is covering the whole body, and that's what you feel when you touch somebody. You don't feel distinct bodies under it. And this whole body suit can become quite thick at certain places if it's loaded in everyday life. For example, the IT band, iliotibial band, is a very specific structure for Homo sapiens. There is no other animal on this planet that has this long, shiny, thick, fibrous uh, fascial sheet. This is the largest fascial sheet that we have in our body and no other animal has it. Do all uh, humans have it? No. It depends how they have been moving in the last couple of years. So if you touch yourself on the outside, let's say uh, one hand above the knee and compare it with the medial side, in most of you the outside is much stiffer under the skin compared with the medial side. If you treat wheelchair people who come to you in a wheelchair, the difference will be gone. They, they do not have an IT band. It is created by loading it. The medial side in them is as soft as your, you know, the lateral side in them is as soft as the medial side in them. So you see, this is a very interesting tissue that has been virtually neglected. It's been called the Cinderella tissue in orthopedic medicine. There are many reasons why it has been overlooked. One reason, it's not very sexy in a cadaver. It doesn't look very reflective, or very appalling. I will show later the video how it looks in alive people, not in cadavers. And there it is a very beautiful tissue. But in the formalin cadavers, it is the only tissue still in most universities that the medical students are allowed to throw away. Every other piece of tissue they need to preserve until the final funeral of the cadavers at the very end there. So it's been considered basically a packing and a race product. And there are many reasons for us to understand why that has happened. Uh, one thing is it's a contextual organ. So you, it resists uh, an attempt to fragment it. Uh, male scientists, we love to cut something into pieces, then count the pieces, give them names, and then to study how they belong together, so what kind of functions they have. We have been able to do that with the skeleton. So we have 230 bones. Uh, we have 500 muscles, but if I would ask you how many fascia do we have in the human body, and you would have to count them, we have the plantar fascia, the iliotib fascia lata. So the question is, do we have more fascia than muscles or less? And you see the question is very difficult. F fascia doesn't want to be cut into pieces, but there is only one answer. You have one fascial net. And you have one piece of fascia that envelops the whole body and it forms several hundred pockets and pockets in pockets and dense ligamentous stratifications according whether you have been a cowboy or whether you have been a marathon runner or, or whatever you have been doing this. So basically uh, fascia resists the splitting apart and that was one reason why it was difficult to to describe it with precision. Now we have computer models in which you can comp uh, describe something precisely which you cannot cut into pieces. But in the past, if you wanted to describe something in a logical text, you wanted to say this is one piece, this is another piece. So that is one reason for it. The other reason why it's been overlooked for many, many decades is we didn't have methods for quantification. Uh, uh, for measurement. Uh, the people who were measuring fascia, they were doing it with subjective palpation. They say, oh, this is stiffer here than there. And then you do a manipulation and you say, wow, oh, ah, now it's more alive. But for medical scientists, th this is not very convincing because you could have all kinds of expectancy factors involved. So they preferred to measure tissues, for example, bones, cartilage with x-rays, and for many decades we had EMG, electromyography, to measure muscles when they move. But for fascia we didn't have the tools. 
but now during the last couple of years mostly ultrasound elastography I'll be showing you some pictures allows us to look at fascia in in moving people and that makes it uh, of course acceptable for scientific measurements so uh, in the last three or four decades fascia has, has been overlooked uh, and just recently it, it has come back more uh, this is uh, the invitation to the 2007 first fascia research congress uh, that was happening at the grounds of harvard medical school in in boston and there were several of us body workers involved tom myers was involved tom findley were involved leon chater were involved and uh, we now look back and say we did one thing good in our life there are millions now as we speak being invested into fascia research which is unbelievable i mean eight years ago that would have been unbelievable because it was just some weirdos who were talking about fascia but but now we have the time and it was basically the parallel to the glia cell research so this was the boston congress it was highly successful uh, uh, sold out with 600 people months before and now if we had the third fascia research congress also just a couple of months ago several of you were there that was also sold out weeks before with 800 people and now you cannot stop the whole movement and and it's basically uh, it's important for us to understand there is no single hero there but it's 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 a time phenomenon and it's not a fad it's basically a missing piece has been overlooked for so long and it's basically the medical doctors uh, who realize fascia isn't that the stuff that we have been throwing away and you guys tell us this is important and and and, and they realize it's everywhere it's in every organ that you study it's embedded in connective tissue uh, here is a beautiful example on the force transmission how powerful fascia can be and that had been known already before the boston congress uh, the it band that we have been just talking about can resist up to 900 kilograms before it tears and there is an interesting discussion at the moment whether lying on a foam roller can do any good i know leon chatov is involved tom meyer says don't do it you will never be strong enough because if you pull on the it band you would need to pull at least with 800 kilograms before it cre before it yields but the question is if you apply perpendicular pressure you may not need 900 kilograms to do that so and you could still loosen some adhesions and do many other things but this is a very important structure has been in sports medicine and it's a very beautiful example how thick it is usually in male clients it is much more stringy than in female clients particularly if they are soccer players or runners it's really thick and you can palpate there and it's been explained that the thickness is caused mainly by the gluteus maximus and by the tensor fascia lata that they insert into this broad band that you have here on the lateral side and that makes a lot of sense uh, this is a very good example for the discussion that has been happening in the last couple of years because this drawing comes from a new article in the journal of anatomy which is uh, has a very high level of, re of respectability in the academic world in which they bring in fascia back into the uh, into the world of connective tissue research and uh, interesting enough they cut a very important piece away with a scalpel which i believe you cannot understand the fascia lata if you cut that piece away because in many of my male clients who do have it band syndrome these are the soccer players who have lateral pain above the knee uh, this piece that they cut away is the most dense who who knows which piece they cut away basically any ligament you have to cut the anterior border because you so where does it start where does it stop that's artificial but they cut a very important piece away you'll see it here on the second uh, picture that's from netter showing the same structure so you see Netter made it much more thin down here than uh, Miltz and Benjamin did up here so that's all arbitrary how thick you make the ligament the person with the knife decides <laughs> but uh, here you see the so-called ligamentous portion that they cut away in this picture it doesn't have a name so we call it the ligamentous portion often in fashion anatomy names are very unreliable 
so it's better to think in terms of shapes rather than in terms of names. Uh, so this piece here is a continuation of the IT band over the greater tocanter attaching at the iliac crest and you can see here in this person it would have been quite substantial before because the iliac crest is almost twice as thick exactly at that portion not because a single muscle attaches there but because of that strong ligamentous pull the question is why did they cut this important piece away in order to publish in Journal of Anatomy. The explanation is quite revealing and that's why I included in most of the talks now. Because they wanted to follow proper terminology and spe that's where especially we Germans are uh, fond of. You know the ones who use this terminology more precise usually feel superior to the other one who calls fascia anything or ligaments anything. And in classical anatomy, there is a difference between an aponeurosis and fascia and ligaments. And the question was, is the IT band an aponeurosis or is it not? An aponeurosis is defined as a tendinous sheet, so a transition from red muscle fibers into the skeleton. If you have red muscle fibers going into it, and if it's flat, you call it an aponeurosis. So the question was, is this an aponeurosis or is it like the plantar fascia, just fascia without being a, because the architecture could be quite different. So they discussed it and they realized we have to call it an aponeurosis because otherwise the tensor fascia lata wouldn't have any function. It, it needs this tissue as an aponeurosis. So we, so we define it as an aponeurosis according to Gray's anatomy Fascia is not an aponeurosis, ligament is not an aponeurosis, so we cut everything away that contradicts our terminology. And they threw the baby out with the bath water. And that often happens, and that's a very important example for us in terms of connective tissue anatomy. Uh, the splitters have done a lot of damage. We have so many different names there. And our view basically that we have been proposing now is based on these damages that have been done by different distinguishing terminologies that claim to have functional differences between tissues in which there often there is none, in which the continuity is overlooked. So the new terminology of fascia that you find in the new Elsevier book which just came out, so in the new fascia literature not those books that have been written eight years ago, you find a new terminology for fascia that we have been suggesting in which basically all collagenous fibrous connective tissues are considered to be fascial tissues. Whether they are like a band, whether they are like an envelope, whether they are a joint capsule that has pulleys going into it, whether it's loose connective tissue under the skin like here, the skin can transmit quite a lot of force. That was a very important insight in the last years. Uh, it, it, it seems like loose connective tissue, but if you do that, for example, you pinch the skin on the back of your wrist, so you hold it here, and then you try to make a fist. You cannot do a fist anymore, do it without, it's very easy and then only pinch the skin there and you can see how a skin adhesion or skin uh, contracture can limit your movement. So if somebody cannot get their arm up, it may be not the lumbar dorsal fascia, it may be not the rotator cuff, it may be the loose connective tissue under the skin and they have the same problem. So that's why we include Contrary to previous attempts in terminology, we include the so-called superficial fascia. Gray's Anatomy called it superficial fascia before. But if you go into the nomina terminologica, where they try to define fascia only for dense, fibrous, irregular connective tissue, and then you are asked, what do you mean with irregular? And then it's very unclear whether a crisscross lattice arrangement is fascia or not. Because I will, I will show you data, fascia is not irregular. It has very interesting mixing fiber directions that that's, uh, uh, reveal a lot about it. So this is a new terminology that has been proposed, which I like a lot. And Devo will apply it in the second half of this afternoon towards movement. 
in which you have a body-wide fibrous connective tissue network that is primarily formed by stretch loading. So in the body you have tissues that are primarily shaped by compression loading and then they become bones or they become cartilage. You have other areas that are primarily loaded by stretch and they become fibrous. So they become part of the collagen network. And so we include them all. So these aponeuroses are included. Also the intramuscular connective tissue is included. That was not clear in the past whether the intramuscular connective tissue is called fascia. The epimysium that surrounds the muscle on the outside, that was always considered fascia. But the continuation towards the inside is a muscle septum fascia. Of course it is. It's a, it's a continuation of the tissue. But also the perimysium, very important, that surrounds the individual fiber bundles. And that's apparently uh, mostly uh, responsible for tight muscles that you have. For example, my upper trapezius here is quite thick and most likely when I'm under anesthesia and you would come, Robert, can I touch you? I cannot contradict, of course. So you touch me there and we are doing now experiments like that at Ulm University where you come with a digital finger that doesn't know that this is supposed to be stiffer afterwards and you compare the stiffness of the upper trapezius uh, before anesthesia, after anesthesia, and you would probably feel that my upper trapezius is still stiffer even though the muscles are relaxed. That stiffness, we have found out, comes from the perimysium, not from the epimysium that surrounds the whole muscle. The perimysium is a very interesting layer. It makes the difference between tough meat and tender meat in meat science. It's also where most of the vessels are. So we happily include that in the new terminology of the fascial net, but also the endomysium, which surrounds uh, uh, individual myofibril. And that terminology basically is inspired by the tensegrity network. Hands up for those who have read about tensegrity before. I would g guess it's more than half of you. Uh, Tom Meyer's book is still the best uh, literature in English language uh, on tensegrity. I highly recommend it and that has been an, an inspiration for most of us that we see all the collagenous fibrous connective tissues being elements of a stretch loaded body-wide uh, tissue network. Basically the new terminology for fascia is synonymous with what the lay person would have called connective tissue. For a scientist, bones are connective tissue, blood is connective tissue, they all come from the mesenchyme. But what a lay person understands as connective tissue, you can say this is a fascial network. We had long discussions before the Harvard Congress whether we should call this field connective tissue research or applied connective tissue research and for very good reasons we did not because in medical science there is already an established field with a lot of history and backup that's called connective tissue research. I'm a member of two connective tissue research societies. They have their own meetings and journals. has nothing to do, almost nothing to do, what we are looking at here. They have gone into molecular dynamics. It's, ma it's mostly matrix biology. They look at bones and different collagen uh, genes in bone structures. But the macroscopic body-wide force transmission has, has not been included in them. And that's why we use the term fascia. In, in Latin it means binding together, uh, basically to look at a body-wide tensional system. Very interesting also when we later go into movement, in graceful movement, usually it's different to clumsy movement that you have less compression and more stretch at the beginning. Or the, those who are there this morning with the yoga, you could see where when a movement is connected, it has more stretch elements in it rather than uh, a bony computer moving solid bones with each other. So it's basically a stretch-shaped fibrous connective tissue network. This is an, an example for the excitement that we clinicians got at the second uh, congress it was introduced by the scientists in which they did a straight leg raise with a very fresh 
uh, unembalmed cad cadaver. So it means the fascia move as much as they do in living people. If you come up to standing, and you put the right leg with a straight knee slightly forward and find a stretch that stretches the posterior side of the thigh. So for me it would be bending the hip. So I feel basically a stretch on the, on the hamstrings of that right leg. And the question is, how, so, so can you shift the stretch to go more to the knee? Can you shift the stretch to be higher up? I can influence it a little bit by bending the knees, getting it straight. What would you need to do to get the strain, the subjective strain, because you don't have a measurement instrument, more to the lateral side? Would you have to put the knee, to the leg more to the right, to the left, forward, back, rotate it? So for me, I rotate it external, and then I feel a stretch up here. Question, do you feel a stretch in the front of your neck while you do that? Well, I can feel it anywhere if you want me to. <laughs> yeah. so, so not so likely. But uh, do you feel a stretch in your buttocks? I do, a little bit. Do you feel a stretch in the plantar fascia? Well, with lots of meditation, you may be able to. Do you feel a stretch in your left armpit while you do that? Maybe carry does, yeah. So you so you subjectively feel stretch loading at different areas of your body. Thank you very much. Sit down. So this is what we had for many decades, and then you have discussions. Where does the stretch go? And one yoga person says it goes here. The other one does that. Then Tom Myers finds very nice lines that he can put together from Neto's anatomy and says this is an uh, anatomy train. Then a French osteopath says, no, the muscle force goes this way. And then you go and take a scalpel. And basically in the dissection room, you can cut any direction that you want, similar like in a piece of wood. But that's not convincing in terms of saying, where does the tension go? So what they did is very interesting. They cut a hole into the superficial, into the uh, dermis and the superficial fascia until you see the body suit the fascia profunda that's covering the whole body and they put in strain gauges that measure the stretch in terms of millimeters at 30 degrees hip flexion 60 degrees etc and uh, not to uh, my surprise they measured that you get about 10 millimeters extension when you do a straight leg raise maneuver for 60 degrees and at the f first degrees nothing happens but then uh, there's a linear increase but then they also wanted to know how other tissues in the body may be co-stretched simultaneously. And for example, they discovered, and that's a big, uh, that could be a surprise, that the plantar fascia also has a stretch, although you did not allow, even if you keep the, do the angle of uh, dorsiflexion at 90 degrees, there is a stretch within the plantar fascia, which is not so easy to explain. It doesn't stretch as much as the hamstrings do, but if you feel it or not, but if you measure it, there is a stretch within the plantar fascia there and also in several other areas. But the biggest surprise was that there were some areas in the body, they moved much more than the area that you felt primarily. Primarily, everybody of you felt that the backside is getting the stretch in a straight leg raise, but they tell you no, you should feel, should, with a question mark, uh, most of the stretch on the lateral side, even when you stretch it straight forward. That's not what I feel. And they found out that the stretch on the lateral side is more than twice in terms of millimeter per degree of flexion, then you have it on the backside, and that's a surprise. I wouldn't expect that. I mean, it's easy to explain why you would also have a stretch on the lateral side with the gluteus maximus going over there. But how do you explain that the stretch is twice as much on the lateral side than you have on the posterior side? This is a, a typical fascial envelope. And for those who of, do, of you who are doing the fascial fitness, we promise you will get fascia like that if you practice fascial fitness. 
<laughs> and this is the factor that you want to have, not only in long overnight uh, in, in overcontinental flights, where you can buy artificial fascia like that, because it's great for your circulation. And they found out that young people have fascia like that. Old people who don't move much, they have more felt-like multidirectional arrangement. So uh, basically what I said have this to do, they, they found out that the fiber angle is very diff different for the hamstrings than it is for the IT band. The hamstrings are, muscle, are bulging muscles, similar like my biceps here. So in the middle of those muscles, you have this lattice-like fiber arrangement. And that explains, so if you put it here, you can stretch it 100% and let go and it will recover. And that's a very unique feature that you try it with any other material on your neighbor or on yourself, that you stretch something 100% and, and it completely recovers to the original size before. So most, materi so most materials uh, you can stretch 10%, but then they start to, to, to lose integrity. So here you can do it 100%. If you want to explain that, you need to look at the geometry, because the material property alone is not an explanation. If you pull longitudinal on any of those ropes, it's not so impressive you can only stretch 10%. But if you arrange them in the right angle, you get 100% recoverable uh, elongation. So it means the architecture makes a huge difference. And that is their explanation, which they didn't say it's proven, but that was their most understandable explanation. When you do this straight leg race here, or if I do it in standing, I move my sit bones two centimeters away from the knee. If the connection is like that, and I move two centimeters away, and I measure half of the way up here, I only get half of the two centimeters. So similar, if I stretch here, and I measure in between, I only get one centimeter also while I stretch. So you have a lot of buffering. A lot of the stretch is lost within a mesh, if you have a mesh. But if you have the fibers arranged in parallel, like you tend to have them, not in cowboys, but in, locomo in, in biped people, that you have a lot of ligamentous parallel arrangement of the fibers, and you pull two centimeters away, two centimeters will arrive. So it means that was their explanation why the same movement of the same bones transmits much more directly along the lateral side than it travels along the posterior side, provided you have a, a two-dimensional lattice-like uh, orientation. If you have injuries in between, it doesn't work. So somebody who has scar tissue here, they may feel the, the stretch very, very different than you do it. So that is a very nice example why we need to know more about the architecture uh, of the way how, how tension transmits in the human body. And so far there is no, not yet an anatomy book that tells you where are the layers adherent with each other? Should they be adherent? Should they be glued? At which area of the body? No book has been telling you that. Just in the last two or three years, mainly the stecos from Padua have been discovering, for example, that the fascial envelopes of the muscles on the limbs they are more adherent with the uh, enveloping fascia profunda and that's the way how it should be. It allows you very good proprioception whereas on the trunk in a healthy person you can peel them off easily and only when you have scarring or when you have inflammation then they glue together. So this is the information that we have been looking forward and nobody has been mapping them down. And that is actually quite exciting that this piece of uh, anatomy has been left out in, in, in the mapping of the human body. This is the field of fascia research. Uh, in the last century, it was only very uh, lost individual heroes. It was basically Ida Rolf, uh, who among the manual therapists has been pounding again and again. You cannot change posture unless you look at fascia. Fascia is the overlooked, the most important organ for health and for postural uh, arrangement and for movement. Similar, the founder of osteopathy.
He did a lot of anatomical dissections, not so much on humans, but on fresh deer early in the morning. He would go with the hunters when they were shooting deer and he would get, and he would get his hands into their fascia. And basically he often said this was his main inspiration for the creation of his work. And now this is a fascial, uh, just, this is just a glimpse of the fascial network of our times and it, it's a little bit like a gold rush atmosphere in which an, a field has been overlooked and now in the last couple of years more and more research teams are going out and there is a lot of networking and I like it. I hope it will stay that way. This was in the er early years of the gold rush too, that the teams were not shooting each other. But I found something there, no, I found something there. Because it's very easy to make major discoveries in an area where nobody has been digging before. And it's similar like in the glia cells. Uh, so if you include fascia into ongoing research, you have a 30% likelihood that you make a major discovery <laughs> and you enter history with, with uh, But in 20 years, somebody will have digged there and you have to say, no, I have been there before you. But at the moment, it's a very nice networking activity all over the planet. And I, and I think it fits to this tissue. Uh, and many of us are kind of making jokes that if you want to understand the fascial network, it works well if you simulate some of the networking dynamics in your social collaborations too. And normally in science it's very competitive, but in the field of connective tissue research in the last years it has been very collaborative. These are the four topics that I would like to cover in the next 45 minutes with you. The sensory innovation, fascia is a sensory organ. Fascial tonicity, that will be more brief. That's more what our uh, laboratory has been focusing on. How can fascia change its stiffness? Not in minutes, but over several days and weeks. And then fascia in manual therapy. How does it respond to manual therapy? What new explanation concepts do we have? So when Saul and I and BB are working on connective tissue, what could be happening in the fascial tissues? And then, leading over to Devo's presentation, fascia in movement therapy. Let me get started with sensory innovation. This is probably the most dear subject to my research and to my hands-on work. That due to, le let me summarize it in, a, in one sentence statement. According to what we know now, fascia is your richest sensory organ for feeling your body. It's possibly your richest sensory organ altogether. Uh, it's uh, possible that we have more nerve receptors in the fascial network than we have in the retina in humans. Uh, but it's definitely the richest sensory organ for proprioception but also for interoception, for feeling your body and for possible pain. But for feeling your body or for not feeling your body. If you define fascia like I have been doing it, in which the loose connective tissue inside the muscles is included, in which the joint capsules are included, in which the periosteum is included, that's a nerve sheet around the bones that's highly innervated with free nerve endings. There are four types of mechanoreceptors in fascia, that they, they respond to different touch qualities in manual therapy. So you have the Golgi receptors, they are not only in tendons, but they are all over where you have sheets. They respond more to strong longitudinal stretch and that, has a, that lowers more the muscle tonus. And then you have a lot of these interstitial free nerve endings and they are more linked with the autonomic nervous system and they are also more linked with interoception if you treat them in the guts. Now if you, if you stain them, and that's a very new publication, it just came out in December by Professor Menze from Heidelberg and his group, they took uh, lumbar fascia from human people and applied a staining marker for all sensory neurons in it and this is how dense it looks like. So if I take a one centimeter piece of your lumbar fascia and we put it on a microscope, this is not blood vessels, this is not lymph, this is your innervation in it. So we know that it is a densely innervated tissue. Interesting enough, a lot of the innervation are sympathetic nerve fibers and 
Some of them are related to the circulation, to the arterioles, to regulate the dilation, so they go parallel to the vessels, but they are much more than you would need for that, and you also find them up outside of the blood vessels, so we don't know what they are doing there. That's a big koan there. But all the research has shown that we have a, a very high sympathetic innervation of fascia, and we don't know really what it's doing. Th this is a new poster that we have developed where you have a body-wide cat suit that helps yourself to feel yourself in, in space. You do have some pressure receptors, but they seem to play a minor role. Most of the, when you feel your body, it's not that you feel <coughs> that your joint is changing in angle. You feel the stretch on the long side. You do not feel the compression on the short side. At least if you shift your focus that way, then you have a finer resolution in, in your facial body. A big surprise for me was when you look for at which areas is the sensory resolution or where you have a higher density of uh, sensory receptors. That's a very important question for those of you who are touching. Because one way of saying why I don't need so much force to work with your fascia is that I say I'm stimulating mechanoreceptors in your fascia and that allows you to refine your body schema and body image up there. So it's a proprioceptive stimulation. Uh, so then rather than touching every centimeter of the body it would be highly useful to know which areas do have are used by the central nervous system to feel where the boat is going so so which are used for self-sensing and the stecos which is a driving force in fascia research they have done it for the limbs so far not yet for the torso and they have found that the, those structures who are transmitting force longitudinally have a very low density in proprioception. For example, the Lacertus fibrosis, which is from the biceps brachii. It, besides the tendinous attachment that you read for the exam, it, all the muscles, or almost all muscles, have a membranous attachment through which they pass the force to a broad membrane that transmits the force several joints further away. So you have that here in the biceps, you have it in gluteus maximus. Sometimes they pass 20% uh, of the force only, sometimes 80% of the fibers, like in the gluteus maximus, go to a fascial membrane that has no specific joint effect. It just tightens your stockings. And that's how horses are sleeping when they want to sleep. They are not tightening the knee flexors and the knee extensors. They are tightening the fascial envelope on the outside. And then you can sleep and the storm comes. So many muscles have a membranous, diffuse uh, spreading of the longitudinal force as the Lacertus fibrosis is doing there. Interesting enough, these places are very important for force transmission, but they have lower importance for proprioception. Big surprise for me. As opposed to some structures that seem to have very low force transmission, much less than I would have suspected, and they run perpendicular to the tendons underneath. For example, the retinaculi. At the foot you have several retinaculi, you have it at the hand, and they found out that basically in all the major joints you have retinacular fascia, whether you have been calling them that way or not. I used to think I need these retinacular for the tendons to have a uh, uh, in, uh, to stay in place. But apparently you can cut the retinaculum and leave the fascia underneath and the tendons function very well, except for the proprioception. So the retinacula are not force transmitting devices. They are not needed for biomechanical uh, uh, purposes. They are sensors. They are put over there. So when, when you're standing on one leg and you try to do that brushing your teeth, and on some days I can do that well, on other days I don't do it that well, my retinacula realizes that now my big toe tendon is active. So I better adjust my pelvic weight in that direction, and I get that in a split second. So basically, uh, which of those five or seven pulleys is active, I sense with the retinaculum going over it. So if you then injure the retinaculum in a surgery, 
Biomechanical force transmission is good, but proprioception. You will no longer be able to brush your teeth with your eyes closed or standing on one leg because you are a split second too slow in it. This carefully would mean for my roughing practice, if I want to work with your proprioception, I work on the red knuckler. I don't waste my time working directly at the plantar fascia if I want to strengthen the proprioception. The even bigger surprise from that field comes also from the Mendes study in which they looked at different layers, surface to deep, in terms of the innervation density. Which layer has the most density of stretch receptors in it? Then I want to reach that layer with, with my arms and with my movement. So this is your lumbar fascia, this is the erector spinae, this is the subcutaneous tissue and the skin would be somewhere up here. And then they stained it and here you see a column diagram of the amount of nerves found. So this would be 100% of the nerves and you see that 90% of the nerves were found in the subcutaneous connective tissue. This is what your neighbor is getting moved away with the liposuction. So this is a fatty tissue that they think is not uh, is not much needed. So the fatty tissue and this outer layer, which is like a hyaluron-rich sliding layer between the fascia and the subcutaneous tissue. This is where 90% of the innervation is. And the dense layer that I would have expected, that I have been trying to reach with my roughing strokes, nobody at home. <laughs> So when I'm trying to go to the home, I'm passing through the important people and they may respond or not, but when I'm in the home, nobody is there. So this is uh, a big surprise for me. It means that the superficial layers seem to... Ah, here we have it. Uh, if you skin an animal, usually there is one layer that's much easier to peel away. So this is peeling uh, an animal. Here you have the skin and you see this transparent fascia, which is part of the superficial fascia that's transparent. And here in white you have the fascia profunda, and you see that there is one membranous layer of superficial fascia staying on the left, and another layer staying on the right. And that's where you have most of the shearing happening, in those areas where you have been not wounded in your body. So you have free, free sliding there. Where you had injury, where you had inflammation, you cannot do it as well. Or in many of my clients, interesting enough, we also found it in rats, you find adhesions in that sliding zone. And that is the zone where 90% of the proprioception is at home. So when you move or when you want your client to feel whether they have a low doses or a straight back without having a mirror, this is where they feel it, if they feel it. We used to think in the past that feeling your body comes from three sources, from the joint receptors, which are in the ligaments and the capsule, then from the skin and from the spindles. Now the research has shown the spindles are not many, they are very few, and that the deep joint receptors, they only fire at the end range of motion. So when you're here, then they fire, and when you're here. But in this range where I want my client to feel, they are not sensitive enough. But this layer is sensitive enough. So then it's the skin gliding. How many of you are working with uh, skin taping, kinesio skin taping, or you have practiced? It's a big field now, and it's, uh, it's highly efficient, particularly for proprioception and in sports people. And, and whether they feel where their knee is going in, in one-tenth of a second or in two-tenths of a second, a skin can change. It, it augments the area of skin involvement. So that would be a possible explanation that the, if a person with good proprioception, they feel this gliding zone on the transition between the superficial fascia and the fascia profunda, exactly the zone where you tend to find most of the adhesions where you have a lot of the blood vessels and of the nerves also happening there. And it, it could be also meaning for our structural integrators. This has been a provocation for me. As a German rofer, I, I got my pride from working deeper than other massage practitioners are working. And we still have it, you know, rofers do it deeper or something like that. 
and 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 you try to go for the iliopsoas where other people are only doing superficial massage but it may be i'm doing this a little bit provocative that the cosmetic uh, massage practitioner who is doing that to your client may have more profound effects than you are doing who is plowing into their uh, iliopsoas fascia going for the deep fascia underneath so that is one of the surprises and one of the inspirations. But fascia has also been shown to be a potential source of pain, of many sources of pain for which we didn't know the origin before. This is an example, the delayed onset muscle soreness that has been an enigma in sports uh, science where you create it by stepping up. Let me do it this way. So if I go always up with the right leg and I go down, by standing with the left. So the right leg always leads. Here it does concentric contraction and here the left one does eccentric contraction. So you do that a thousand steps. Then all of you will be tired except some of you have done it professionally. And then you are after one day you have delayed onset muscle soreness. On which leg more? On the uphill walking one or the downhill one? Yeah, it's always a downhill one, although in terms of physical calories, etc., the energy should be at least the same at the other, the, energy, uh, the, the work amount. So, uh, they were try so the old concept of lactic acid is no longer believed. That's no longer true because lactic acid increases for a few hours, but on the next day it's back to baseline. But that's when people have the pain. So the pain must come from somewhere else. In order to find that out, they had designed an experiment in which they then, after talking with us fascia people, they said, OK, if you're really right, let's see, it doesn't cost us much more. We include the fascia. We don't believe that it plays a role, but we can include it anyway. And that's happening now in many laboratories worldwide. If they are already doing a study looking at the musculature, you can convince them, why don't you include the fascia? And then you don't need to get all the money, etc. So here it was easy. They were injecting a, a saline solution, basically water and the same minerals that you have in the body, but a hypotonic saline solution at which the salt concentration is slightly more than you have inside of your body. Normally that doesn't do anything. It's not painful because it feels like I'm just getting the same liquid. But if the tissue is already inflamed or is already in a painful condition, then it responds to any kind of deviation and the body will say, this is not healthy, this is not my, my own tissue. So this is what they had planned. They injected that hypotonic saline solution into the muscle belly, vastus medialis on the right side and on the left side. Now, due to the fascia research, they said we also injected in some people in the fascial envelope only, in the epimysium. And with ultrasound you can control whether it stays there. And to their big surprise, the result was very, very clear. Whenever they injected in the muscle, no response. When they injected in the fascial envelope only, there was a clear response by the downhill leg, but no response on the uphill leg. So next time you talk about delayed muscle, uh, muscle onset soreness, you have to call it fascia pain. The pain comes from the fascial envelope. We don't know what's happening there, whether there are micro injuries there, or whether it's just a sensitization of the stretch receptors in the fascial envelope. But the delayed muscle onset soreness comes from the fascial envelope. It doesn't come from the red muscle fibers underneath. And that's, uh, that's one of the first indications we got in the last few years, that fascia can be a pain-generating tissue. The more important one that we have is that uh, low back pain uh, seems to be caused in many cases by irritation from the lumbar fascia. That used to be a a hypothesis in 2006 by one of the gurus in low back stability, uh, Panjabi, he published a hypothesis in European spine and, uh, uh, and this is actually not his paper, this is a uh, letter to the editor that we wrote together with Andre Fleming uh, because he had su suggested that there are micro injuries 
in the power spinal connective tissues, which are so small that with our current imaging technology, we cannot show them. How thick do you think is the lumbar fascia? Three millimeters, two, one, five. Yeah, it can hold a lot of force. It's usually b between 0.7 and 1.5 millimeters only. So it's thinner than the tablecloth. So uh, if, if that gets, so basically like a saran foil or cling film in the kitchen, which is 1 50th of a millimeter, if you take that 10 layers, you can put a heavy pot of water on it and slide it on a clean floor. So force transmission can be quite powerful if you have a membranous structure which is very thin until you get the first injury. Then the pot, so one, you, once you have the first injury, the force transmission is no longer so good. So the, most of our fascia are transparent. Even the, uh, the lumbar fascia also is half transparent in a live person. Only after 10 minutes of air exposure, it becomes dull and no longer and, and opaque. So if it then gets 10% thicker or 20% thicker because of injury, you won't see it in ultrasound yet, but in the next two or three years the resolution will be high enough that they can find out where do people need fascia therapy and where do they need disc surgery. So basically what we had suggested is that the lumbar fascia should be included as a potential source for micro injuries, not just the joint capsule that he had suggested. And this is now a very important field. Um, there are several papers published in the literature there was an American surgeon in the 50s. He skinned his clients before he did disc surgery. And he found in more than 90% of them, there were clear signs of hernia in the lumbar fascia or scarring or inflammation. What he didn't have is groups of healthy people who would allow himself to be skinned and to be looked at into for comparison. But we now have additional research, this is from our laboratory, where we took samples for people who are going for disc surgery because they have low back pain. And we looked for the density of myofibroblasts of these contractile cells. And you can see that they have a high density of these dark brown cells. The density is comparable to somebody who has frozen shoulder. These are contractile cells that are associated with wound contracture. You also have the midubitran contracture, the contracture in the palm of older men uh, who are over 60s. Every fifth man has this plantar uh, palmar fascia contracture. So it means that this person has a condition at his lumbar fascia which you could call frozen lumbars. In frozen shoulder it has nothing to do with the muscles but the fascia has become very, very tight and ad adhering together. So some cases of low back pain may be associated with scarring and thickening uh, of the lumbar fascia. This is uh, Helen Lagerwe, she's a star in fascia research. She used to be number one in acupuncture research in the United States and now she got uh, over one, one million dollar grant to study nothing else besides the lumbar fascia in low back pain. And she works very, very clean in terms of her method methodology. So she got a matching control group where she compared the thickness and the sheer ability of the lumbar fascia in people with low back pain compared with non-low back pain. And she found there are clear differences. Basically, the fascia is more adherent in people who have low back pain. We don't know whether that's cause or effect, but it means the fascia plays a major role. And finally, this is uh, Menzies' recent publication again. He used a specific marker for nociceptive free nerve endings. And he showed that we all have these nociceptive free nerve endings that are substance P positive or calcitonin gene related peptide containing nerve endings in our lumbar fascia. So it means the lumbar fascia is designed to be a potential pain generator by, by its anatomy. Even more, when you inflame, not the fascia, but when you inflame the erector spinae, then the central, uh, the, then the 
spinal cord switches over the sensitivity of the fascia to become hypersensitive. So in a normal fascia, in a normal rat here, they were looking at the spinal cord at the level of L3, what kind of stimulation leads to activation of the posterior horn of L3 and you can see basically the, the in red here are the muscle tissues. If you stimulate them you get a segmental innervation there. The same thing fascia. So basically fascia also has a segmental innervation that was not known before. As much as you have myotomes or dermatomes you should call you, you should talk about fascia tomes but only in a healthy body because when you inflame, not the fascia, but you inflame the erector spinae with a certain substance, look at that picture. Then the area of fascia which, to which the spinal cord reacts has exploded. Then any kind of fascia shear, even down your tail, even half up your upper back, and your spinal cord says, oh, something is happening. And the fascia has not been insulted, so it's, it's a very interesting dynamic. If you would be the muscle and I do something bad to you, and you are the fascia, then I walk by you, you react normal, but you start to scream at me if I only get a little closer to you. So that seems to be the way how the body looks at the superficial fascia as a protector, as a radar shield for potential injury or for many, or maybe also for pleasant uh, things. But when you have an injury somewhere, even in another tissue that's innervated from the same level of the spinal cord, it could be maybe your visceral tissue, then the fascia which has not been injured becomes hypersensitive and starts to scream whenever I walk to wrap it past you. So that's an e even stronger indication that uh, a lot of the pain that we get in, p in soft tissue pay may be coming from the fascial tissue and we need to understand them. Mm. Our laboratory has been specialized on contractile cells in fascia. We did find them. We also found that they respond to sympathetic nervous system activation. Not by adrenaline but by another substance that has been called TGF a transforming growth factor which if you are under uh, long-term fight and flight activation your body produces that cytokine and that is the most potent stimulator for the contractile cells in fascia. Interesting enough in cell culture these contractile cells that you have in fascia they tend to contract together at a very slow rhythm at a rhythm around 100 seconds so when you put myofibroblasts in cell culture, give them a collagen grid, and after a while they contract together, similar like you saw with the cardiac cells in, in uh, Ulrich Randall's presentation. And the, but the rhythm is not 8 Hz, it's very, very slow. It's 100 seconds for one contraction and one letting go. Uh, what we don't know is whether the fascia in your body, where it's less densi pa densely packed, also does it. But the rhythm is interesting enough, the same rhythm that the craniosacral biodynamic people report as the breath of life. A hundred second cycle, which they believe comes from outer space. And it's, not, it's nothing related to cellular activity. It could be that they are true. But if you calculate these cells, it would be possible that a skilled sensitive hand would be able to feel them if it exists. So we don't know it yet. In cell culture it does exist. So, so much so you could see that these fibers have an amazing ability to adjust and you don't need to tear them. So when we work in the tissue, first of all it's much more watery than we used to think and we can loosen adhesions that has been shown. You don't need brutal force by that. You don't need to rupture, it's enough to untangle like we saw there. So fibers can split 
after you go away with her, they may unite, they may not unite, they can migrate around a nodal point. So basically fascia is much more watery than we have been thinking of. Let me finish here.